This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. I have to tell you that every, every week I stand up here and I see people I haven't seen in a long time, so yay for that. It's lovely to see you. Um, glad you chose to worship with us this morning. I have a few announcements I want to make. I want to start with a sad one. John Law, who has been helping his mother as she's been ill, lost his mother on Friday. So please keep John in your prayers. Um, and on to happier things. Um, when you leave today and you go out those double doors right there, hang a right and go into the, the um, gallery and have lemonade with us. Um, thing A is that it is not muggy in there. And thing B is it's not raining in there. And thing C is you get a chance to talk to each other. So we have lemonade out in the gallery today. Um, also, while you're out there, take a look at the Share the Bounty table. There are, I'm for sure, there are tomatoes. And there are also some sunflowers, and those are free for the taking as well. So help yourself to what you can find on the bounty table. Mother's Morning Out will meet tomorrow and Wednesday from 9 to noon. That's from, for infants through age 10. Um, all are welcome. And I just want to remind you, and I'm, uh, we will keep reminding you of this, during August, we will go to a single worship service in here at 10 o'clock. The Bible study class will meet at 9 a.m in the McKinnon Room, and the Feasting on the Word class will meet at 11 a.m. in the Pavilion. So just kind of keep an eye on your calendar, is all I can say to that. And let's be called to worship using, called to worship using the words in your bulletin. We rejoice in the one who leads us beside still waters and gives us refreshment of soul. Christ, our shepherd, shows us the way we should go so that the name of God will be glorified. Though all manner of evil befall us, we will not be afraid, for the great shepherd our souls is with us. We are never away from the love and mercy of the Lord, and we shall be with him forever and ever. Please stand.
remember that our Lord Jesus Christ is able to sympathize with us in our weakness, since in every respect he was tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to find help in need. Merciful God, we celebrate the gift of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. He broke down long-standing walls of prejudice and hostility between Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free. He abolished rules that restricted life and replaced them with the new commandment to love as he did. Where have we gone astray? Walls of prejudice still exist, and barriers of racism still hold people back from reaching their true potential. We hear the great message of Jesus reconciling people to you, O God, and to one another, and yet we still hesitate to reach out to people when they are different in some way from us. We remember with gratitude how people shared their faith with us so that we are no longer strangers and aliens. So we pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to bind us together in love and peace, building us up as a witnessing, welcoming, and forgiving community of grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Our scripture reading this morning is from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Listen for the word of the Lord. So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Jesus Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in, in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. 
So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have Ellen Anderson with us, and we have children. So come on up, guys. Anybody else? Oh, come on, kids. We're going to look at shoes today. If you have favorite shoes on, come on and show us your shoes. Okay, everybody put your feet out. Let's look at your shoes. Look at nice shoes. So how come we wear shoes? Why do you wear your shoes? Anybody? Can you think? Well, because I don't want, like, I don't want my feet to get all, just they just hurt if I'm just that's right, yeah. I mean, what would happen if you didn't have your shoes on? You could step on a stone, you could step on a bee. Anybody ever stepped on a bee? Oh, honey, <laughs> what you have to look forward to. <laughs> you broke your foot one time, or you burned your foot. Yeah, you could step on something hot, you could step on a fire, yeah. So we wear our shoes to protect our feet, right? Yeah? Once was we use... <laughs> you can tell me later, okay? Yeah. Yeah, you, your hand hurt too, huh? So we protect our feet with our, with our shoes, and that's how come we wear them. Well, do you know what that the Bible actually talks about what kind of shoes we're supposed to wear? Who knew? It's in the same book that Miss Mary just read from. And can you read for this for us? This is from the book of Ephesians. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Yeah. God says in the Bible that we're supposed to put, protect our feet, protect ourselves, and be, oh, the other reason we wear shoes is so that we can run, right? Yeah. yeah. We wear special shoes for running. And this says so that you'll be fully prepared to do what you have to do in life. You put on the peace that comes from the good news, and the good news is that Jesus loves us, yeah? Jesus loves you, and you, and you, and you, and everyone in here, and everyone in the whole world, all of them too back there, <laughs> even the pastor, yeah? <laughs> anyway, so put on the peace, the peace inside your heart that comes from the good news that Jesus loves you so that you will be so ready to just get out there and run, and I'd say run down that aisle, except you're not supposed to. You're supposed to walk carefully. So let's walk and appreciate your shoes that you're not getting your feet scraped up, okay? See y'all later. So once again in my life, I'll say, I was glad I made the cut. <laughs> Our gospel lesson today is from the Gospel of Mark uh, in the sixth chapter. Then Jesus went about the village's teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. So they went out and proclaimed all that should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick and cured them. Later, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. 
And Jesus said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. They went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. And Jesus went ashore, and he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over again to the lake, they came to Gentere and moored the boat. And when they got out of the boat, people at once recognized Jesus and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The word of the Lord. This is the 11th Sunday that we have been back in the sanctuary. Four, free range without mask or assigned seating. In the Bible, the, the number 10 is used a lot as, as a sign of wholeness. Of course, the number 12 is used a lot as a, as a number of the tribes. So the 11 is an in-between number. And honestly, that's sort of how I feel where we are in our current script. Part of me wants to flip the calendar back to the summer of 2019 and just start where we left off. The other part of me wants to get on with life and figure out what the new normal is. And neither one of those seems like the natural path forward. In the first verse of what I read from the Mark, Jesus has sent the disciples out on a ministry tour. And despite being a bunch of dummies, somehow they've succeeded wildly. They have cast out demons, they have cured the sick, the good news is be heard. And in verse 30, Mark just has Jesus listening, which Mark often depicts Jesus as just listening. So what I'd like to do for the next couple of minutes or so is just say some things that, have been, that I've been wrestling with in this 11 space. And when I say them out loud, I'm not looking for anybody to raise their hands or to say amen, though you might say it inside your head. I'm just trying to help us think about where we are in this particular chapter that we are somewhere in. So first, as a church family, we have gone through a crisis together, but this tide doesn't feel the same yet. There are people who died in our church family, and we were not able to go through our rituals of remembering and grieving. There's unfinished business. There were times during the last 18 months when I was really, really afraid. My assignment during the COVID, I was to be the hunter-gatherer. And so one day I was at Food City, fully masked, socially distanced, and someone behind me sneezed. My heart stopped, all the hair in the back of my head went up. I just froze in place. And it took a couple of minutes before I could look, turn around and look and see Thank God that the person had a mask on, but I remember being terrified. The other time, of course, was the morning our son called us and told us he had COVID. Maybe you had times like that. Those fearful places have left bruises and wounds that are still touchy. I don't think I can ever trust you fill in your blank again. I was so angry at, you fill in your blank again. I'm trying to remember how to be social, right? We went to a movie with some friends the other night, and I just, I felt like I was all thumbs. What do you do? Do you, I mean, it's, how does it mean to be, be interacting with people again? And I'm an extrovert. I mean, come on. <laughs> I thought the shooting of black teenagers happened in other cities. And for those of us who will watch this on tape, I kind of like experiencing worship on tape. Jesus hears the disciples' stories and invites them to a deserted place to rest because they've just, they've, they're worn out from taking care of people and taking care of all the sick in the world. But they can't get any rest because wherever they go, the people show up with all of their pains and their sorrows and their struggles and, 
even in the wilderness. And it says Jesus saw the crowd. In this great line, he saw the crowd, and because they were like sheep without a shepherd, he had this great compassion. In the Old Testament, usually when it talks about a sheep being without a shepherd, it's in reference to a bad king in Israel. But I don't think this is the case in this particular spot. And and Caroline Lewis, a professor at the Lutheran Seminary in St. Paul, uh, agrees. She says, compassion, as you know, the Greek word for compassion, has its root in a word that means guts. My mother would be ashamed if I said that at a pulpit, but guts. (laughs) The seed of feeling, feeling it in your guts. You know that feeling when your reaction to something sends your stomach churning. You get a hitch that you sense physically. You feel that pit, suddenly even painfully. That's compassion, a visceral feeling. Jesus has compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, lost, lacking guidance, but more so in need of care, of protection, of pasture, of tending, of nurture. And those are comforting words, I think, in our 11th space, the space where we don't quite know, are we... Is it, is it everything real? Is it not real? What's, what's the Delta variant going to do to all this? All of these things that are still spinning around in our heads, and we don't even really know how to say where we want to get to from where we are because we're not really sure where we are. So Paul also brings some comfort in Romans 8 and these familiar words that even while we're trying to articulate what it is we think we need in this particular 11 chapter, we don't know the right words. So Paul reminds us again, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes, intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what's in the mind of the spirit, because the inner spirit exceeds for the saints, all the saints, according to the will of God. So all of us lost sheep have this promise that even if we don't know what to pray about of our fears and our pains, the truth, our needs are still being communicated. So any sense of lostness we might feel or, not, or don't know we actually feel, any sense of fearfulness, any sense of loneliness, any sense of painfulness, it's all being communicated to God. It's the ultimate form of telemedicine. The Good Shepherd will see you now. Our beloved Presbyterian friend Fred Rogers said this, all of us at some time or other need help. Whether we're giving or receiving help, each one of us has something valuable to bring to this world. That's one of the things that connects us as neighbors. In our own way, each one of us is a giver and a receiver. In the part of Ephesians that Mary read, Paul is trying to persuade the people in this little church in Ephesus to live together as a community that Christ wants them to be together. In the first century Christian Christian era, There were more Jewish people living outside of Israel than there were living in. And as long as they paid their taxes and didn't disturb the Pax Romana or the Roman peace, they were left alone. It sort of reminds me of the way we lived in Cock County. Just pay your taxes and keep your head down and things, good things will happen. But now this new thing has happened. The Gentiles are in church with them. It's not unlike when a couple marry, they bring their family traditions, both family traditions with them. How do you celebrate holidays? How do you acknowledge this? What are the ways you do that? Are you a Miracle Whip family or are you a mayonnaise family? Are you a Coca-Cola family or are you a Pepsi-Cola family? And for Southerners, those of us who are blessed to be Southerners, the critical question is, how do you make your cornbread? (laughs) And all of these issues get worked out or worked on all through the relationship. So the goal Paul is trying to tell these folks is, The goal of the Gentiles is not to become Jewish. The goal of the Jewish folks is not to become Gentiles, but to become something altogether new and different. And Paul is telling the Gentiles that you were far off from the covenant, but God has brought you who are far off near. He's brought you close. And Christ is our peace, and he has made both groups and broken down all the barriers, the dividing walls between us, the hostility between us. Christ has broken down all those walls so that we can be a community together. After 9-11, one of our pundits said this, the United States should invade all the Middle Eastern countries, kill all their leaders, and convert all of them to Christianity. Now that is the peace, the kind of peace that most of the people in the Roman era would have been used to. 
the peace of the conqueror, the peace of the heavy thumb, the peace of the sword. But Paul's not talking about that kind of peace. He's not talking about the peace that's based on fear. We talk about the peace that's about this Jesus Christ who has come to us wherever we are and trying to bring us closer together, no matter how estranged from each other we may be. The compassionate good shepherd who looks out and sees God's wonderful creation in its multi technicolor glory with tall people and short people and fat people and thin people and men and women, LGBTQ people and different kinds of households, young and old, miracle whip and mayonnaise, all being brought together into the household of God. And I think this God who's trying to bring the far back together so we all are near is also trying that with us in our 11th space. All those things that seem to be so far away from us, that used to be so dear to us, I think God is trying to help us to reconcile those things into whoever this new way of being will be. And of course, that love and compassion shown to us should also be shown by us to a world that's still trying to figure its way home. One of my top 10 favorite movies is Meatballs, starring a young, Eddie, young Bill Murray. It's a raunchy summer camp film uh, set upstate New York. It's one of those camps, it's sort of like a boarding school for, uh, for the summer, where people send their kids away for the summer to have an outdoor experience. In the movie, Rudy is dropped off at camp. His parents almost slow the car down. They literally just kind of flung him out at camp. <laughs> And Rudy is at that age of his life that we've all been in where everything about him is thumbs. He doesn't fit in. He can't do any of the athletic activities. He doesn't fit into any of the other things. The kids all make fun of him. None of the counselors want him on their teams. You know, he's just an outcast. And so ultimately, Rudy does what a lot of us will do in a situation like that. He wants to run away. So he packs his suitcase and heads down to the local Greyhound station and waits to get out of there. Well, Bill Murray is the chief summer counselor, and he goes down to the bus station and just starts a relationship. He doesn't drag Rudy back. He doesn't command him to do anything. He just starts a relationship, and through the relationship, Rudy comes back, and they befriends him, and Bill Murray's a morning jogger, so Rudy becomes a morning jogger, and at the end of the film, there's a big competition between this very uh, second-rate kind of camp and this very deluxe camp and Rudy wins the marathon and becomes a hero. But it's just, to me, it's a great story about someone being so far away on the edge that you really could easily blink and see them disappear, but Bill Murray goes after it. And I think that's the way God goes after us. Pope Francis said that everybody comes out of a crisis different. Some change for the better and some change for the worse. And I think our goal with each other is to kind of come out of this better, even though we have to admit we're going to come out of it different. As we make our way into whatever the next chapter is, to whatever the 12 is, or whatever the holy number is, then let's be a little bit of Bill Murray to each other. Let's be good listeners. Let's notice who's on the edge. Let's be honest with ourselves. Let's be generous in our compassion as God has been generous with us. Amen and amen.
Please join me as we say together what we believe. I believe in Jesus, the best possible shepherd. His wisdom leads me to the best opportunities. His word comforts me when I'm anxious or afraid. His arm steadies me when I feel weary and heavy laden. His wounded body displays the cost of my rescue. I believe in Jesus, the best possible shepherd. I believe that I do not find him, but he finds me. That I, under his care, by virtue of sheer grace, the love he gives me is to be shared with others. That he treasures my name and prepares a place for me that his soul transcends earth and heaven. I trust Jesus, the good shepherd. Please be seated. And join me in prayer. Loving God, we come before you with gratitude today. We give you thanks for the beauty of your creation in midsummer. Gardens are flourishing because you provide sun and rain, and fresh vegetables and fruit are abundant. Remind us to share our bounty with others who might not have as much as we. We give you thanks that, at least for now, we are able to gather together as your church. It is good to worship you, surrounded by those we love. Keep us mindful that many are still not comfortable in crowded settings. Help us be kind and understanding with those who still worry about their health as we slowly get back to some sort of normal. Help us find ways to be the church for those who aren't willing to be in the church yet. We give you thanks for shelter in storms, both physical and metaphorically, when there are people who don't feel safe where they are. Give us ways to be of assistance to those who need our help. We take so much for granted, God, and we are sorry for that. We overlook so many wonders, fireflies in the darkness, the lap of waves on lake shores, cooling breezes in the evening, sunlight sparkling off morning dew, wildflowers in bloom, the gentle touch of a friend, the laughter of a beloved family member, a smile from a stranger. Remind us to pay attention to all of these and so much more. There are so many among us who are struggling. Help us prop up those who are wobbling. Comfort those who grieve, including John. Reassure those who worry and surround those who are lonely. We ask for the loving care of our Good Shepherd, your beloved child, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as the ushers come forward to wait on us, um, I ask that you take the attendance pad and register your attendance today. And let's give back to God some of what has been given to us.
Oh, generous God, your grace is abundant. Your love knows no bounds. You give us comfort when we are broken. You help us stand up when we have no strength. Please help us use this treasure that we have given back to you to reach out to those people that are on the edges that don't know yet the love that you have for them. Amen. Sisters and brothers, in this 11th space that we occupy, let us be comforted by the fact that even though we may not know where we are or where we're going in all this, God knows. And God is the Alpha and God is the Omega, and God will be our Good Shepherd through this. And now may that same God who has come to us in Jesus Christ and equipped us by the power of the Holy Spirit to be God's daughters and sons in this world go with you each and every one. Amen. Amen.